respectability um, becomes a very important part of defining middle class identity in, in Canada. And I would say, I mean, there, there are, you know, people do more work in working class history than I do, but I would say that for a certain portion of the working class in the into the 20th century, it becomes an important means of defining oneself. And I think for middle class people, or people who aspire to be middle class, I think that's even more important, um, claiming respectability was something that that, that was within reach, um, whereas economic stability and security, um, you could have a business one day in, you know, one moment in the 1850s, you could have lost that business by the 1860s. Um, this was not a world of, uh, of great security for some of these people. So if you do not have, you know, for example, lar access to land in a large way um, or uh, a very solid family inheritance, um, a lot of the Canadian middle class was you know, very much in the making during the 19th century and that could involve economic highs but it could as often involve economic lows whether or not the train ran through your town for example, whether or not you know, your businesses were affected by um, the aftershocks of military enterprises somewhere else in the British Empire or, um, or trade on the London market or um, developments in the United States. So, so while I think sometimes we think of these people as being you know, paragons of Victorian respectability, in fact, I think this was something that had to be constantly negotiated. So, uh, so proving, proving one's character um, and adhering to some of the tenets of you know, thrift, um, industry, um, sobriety, for, for some, not for all, but for some, these were things that could, I think, be achieved. Um, they, 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 they might be um, something you have to keep working at, but certainly they were they were possibilities. Whereas um, the the economic part of this was something that m that could be lost at any day. So proving yourself to be you know a churchgoer or um, have you know being able to keep one's family in in, in good order, um, those those were things that that might be attainable. Um, whereas other things might not be beyond one's control. So I think it's that desire to try and try and control circumstances that certainly weren't always. Um, weren't always possible to control. For the for the actresses that I'm, I'm looking at, um, I think they were well aware of some of some of the stigma that it still adhered to the the notion of the actress, the notion of the public woman, the woman who put herself on display, um, the woman who might put herself in in dangerous kinds of situations, um, and who and who asked for public attention. Um, so I, th you know, for for one. Um, you know, performing something like Shakespeare, which by this point had become part of the canon of, of middle class culture, you know, very common, commonly read, taught in schools, understood as a way of, of dealing, with, uh, dealing with rhetoric. Performing Shakespeare was a claim to legitimacy and, and respectability. I think there was more to Shakespeare than that, too. I mean, Shakespeare also offered the possibility of some very strong roles for women and women who made a difference in, in the plays. Um, but at the same time, performing certain kinds of roles, appearing in certain kinds of theaters and not in others was one, one way of managing respectability. Um, so, for example, Pauline Johnson, when she went to, to London um, in 1894 and then again in 1906, uh, was very careful to uh, appear only on, in certain kinds of stages, first in private homes to do her performances as both the, the Edwardian lady and the quote-unquote Indian princess, um, but not appearing, for example, on, say, music hall stages when she performed with her partner, Walter McRae. Uh, again, sort of nego negotiating that line very, very carefully. Uh, some of the other way in which I think these women um, worked hard at, main at maintaining respectability was through their marriages and through their private life uh, and offering up their private life when it was deemed to be respectable by themselves um, for public attention. So, for example, one woman I look at, Margaret Anglin, I've seen her in a number of pieces in publications such as Good Housekeeping or... Um, uh, one, one of the other um, prominent American d domestic periodicals saying, here's my private life, here, here am I with my husband, um, we have a, you know, a lovely home, here is how I manage my home, here is how I deal with servants. Um, even, even though someone like Anglin very rarely dealt with servants, she, and she had maids, she had housekeepers, she was uh, not always wealthy, but for part of her career she was quite well, quite well off and had a number of homes that she had to manage, uh, making sure that they were married 
in, in a church. She was married in the Lady Chapel of St. Patrick's Cathedral. She was also um, made it quite clear that she was a Catholic. And in fact, the Catholic Church in the 1920s um, embraced Anglin as an example of good, virtuous Catholic womanhood. Uh, priests would write to her and nuns would write to her, you know, congratulating her on upholding particular kinds of religious values. And even, uh, even saying, I have a young, you know, I have a young parishioner, she's, or a young student in my convent school who wants to go on the stage. Can you ad advise her as to how she should do this? Um, the, and the other, I think the, the other part of this too was, you know, when they started, some of these women did start to appear in places like vaudeville, but again, in respectable vaudeville houses, in respectable vaudeville shows. Um, when Julia Arthur did this um, pageant of Liberty of Flame, it was the sort of the upper, up, upper end, upper echelon of vaudeville. Um, palaces that she appeared in and then when she did vaudeville again in 1923 it was as Hamlet in, uh, in a 15 minute scene, the scene between Gertrude and, and Hamlet from the play um, that was meant to actually bring Shakespeare to the masses. It was, it was not about, unlike other women, it was not about appearing in blackface, it was not about doing you know titillating dances, it was about bringing the classics to you know to the public. Uh, so I think you know, part, partly managing one's private life and, and also um, uh, also choosing where where one appear. But I, but I see respectability as being something that permeates um, at least the desire to be respectable permeates middle class culture in in the nineteenth century in, in English Canada. Uh, although I've also found some some you know nuances to it. Um, we think of temperance as being the, the epitome of middle class respectability, but I've also found that that drinking out uh, at least for some of the tourists that I looked at in my work on nineteenth um, nineteenth century overseas tourism, I've found that that drinking was not seen as such a, a terrible sin, and in fact that moderate and managed drinking could could also be quite enjoyable. And going to theater, which is again how I sort of ended up um, coming back to this, this project on actresses, going to theater for a number of these people in, in London was something they embraced and wrote about at great length and analyzed and assessed quite, um, quite, you know, quite uh, at a great length.